next speaker is Mr. Trevor Budge. Uh, and my apologies, I could refer to some notes. So, uh, I haven't quite memorised all of his bio. There's quite a bit in it. Which leads to the person that uh, he is who is so good at, at speaking to people and pushing your mind the way that he does. So, Trevor is the manager of strategy at the City of Great Bendigo. He's also uh, an associate professor in the community planning and development program at the Bendigo Camps of Campus of the Trade Union. Uh, he's also a visiting professor, I've just learned, at the University of Moratua in Sri Lanka. He's a geographer planner uh, and he's worked in urban, rural, regional, statutory and strategic planning since the mid-70s and he's lived in Bendigo for most of the last 40 years. He's undertaken studies throughout rural and regional Australia during a 16 year period where he <coughs> ran his own consultancy and is particularly known for his extensive work in the planning and development of country towns. He was State President of the Planning Institute of Australia for three years and he's a life fellow and has a National Lifetime Achievement Award from the Institute. He played a leading role in organising the Institute's seven year post tsunami reconstruction program in Sri Lanka and he was awarded a member AM in the General Division of the Order of Australia in 2011 for services to town planning, particularly the development of regional and rural communities, and to education. Please welcome Trevor. to speak and uh, it's a, a great opportunity for the city and the community to reflect uh, on the future. So when uh, Robin gave me a briefing uh, a, a few weeks ago and said she'd like me to speak, she said, I want you to think big, Trevor. So I, I really started really big. <laughs> and, but I thought that perhaps that was just a bit too big. So I scaled it down a little bit. If you picked up what we're looking at there, there's the Earth and the Moon. Huh? But even that might be a little bit big. And even this is perhaps uh, too big for us to, to tackle tonight. Um, but I, what I'd like to do, though, is to keep it as big as possible. To pose to you a series of questions um, that are almost paradoxical about how we might address environmental matters. And you might, you might see some of those questions and you might think to yourself, how do they relate to the environment? If you think big and you think broadly, they will. But first of all, we need to put aside some um, you know, possible problems that people might think that um, they're here because the council's going to, uh, to solve climate change. The environmental strategy isn't going to solve climate change. Um, we might make some contribution, <coughs> but we're not going to solve it. What I want to talk about is how we might do things differently than what we do at the moment, and how tackling some of these paradoxes that I'm going to put to you may be the way to go. I don't know whether you are a bit like me, I'm overwhelmed by the environmental challenge that we have. And it does seem to me that we almost can despair. So I've tried to analyse the problem in perhaps ways that uh, we can relate to it in our <coughs> everyday life. And I've also tried to address this issue. Why would operating in Bendigo actually give us an advantage in doing this? And again, I'll put some challenges to you around that concept. So first of all, what might be an advantage in Bendigo? And that might, might be a little bit hard for you to pick out, but this is the city of Greater Bendigo area. It's about 3,000 square kilometres. And one of the fundamental differences we have is that about 25% of the area is publicly owned and basically in forest. And there are, of course, significant areas of private land that are forested. This is actually a very unique setting. And it's a setting which I'll talk about it later, about how it relates to what I call our DNA. But the point is that in many respects, for 85% of the population of Bendigo that resides in that urban area, you are aware of that forest surround, but I don't think you, many people are aware of the totality of it. 
and the uniqueness that it provides. If you think about the other regional centres in Victoria, none of them sit inside that environment. Mostly they sit inside an agricultural environment, which gives a different perspective. I'll come back to that issue. <coughs> Some of the other things that might distinguish Bendigo, which might give us an advantage in how we look at the environment, and some of these may be obvious to you, some of them may challenge you. First of all, we're a growing inland city. And why would, I, why would I mention that? Because much of inland Australia is actually in decline, population wise. So in actual fact, I rather suspect that if government, community wants to take notice of places, they're more likely to take notice of places that are growing because in fact the challenges would appear to be quite severe. And the fact that we're in the Murray-Darling Basin, in fact, we are the closest large city to a metropolitan area that is in the Murray-Darling Basin. Think about that across the whole of Australia. Secondly, we know that water is a substantial <coughs> issue in Bendigo, and I'll come back to the issue of water. I've mentioned the fact that we're not sitting inside a food bowl like a Shepparton, like a, like a Maldura, like a Warrnambool like on the Trove Valley. We've got that 25% of vegetation cover. We have a unique urban forest interface. It's unique because we actually interface the urban area with a national park. Again, very, very few places in the world interface their urban area with a national park. We've developed at a low density, and the Mayor's already made reference to the fact that we've got to change that. I suspect that in many respects, uh, from a social, economical, uh, economic point of view, a cultural <coughs> point of view, we are a bit like a microcosm of a metropolitan area. And there are distinct advantages in being able to say that you have the characteristics of a metropolitan area in your social and community and cultural makeup. So we do, I believe, provide a potential laboratory for other people to look at how we tackle issues. In terms of positioning us, in terms of funding, in terms of grants, in terms of recognition, uh, these are important. Here's another element of importance. Here we have the city of Great Bendigo overlaid on the Melbourne metropolitan area. One, it gives you an idea of scale, but the most important thing I want to point out here is the governance issues. So when somebody addresses an, an, an issue in Melbourne, an environmental issue, whatever the agenda is, they basically have got to, in terms of local government, deal with 35 separate organisations. What I'm suggesting here is it's very convenient for government to be able to say, we can embrace 3,000 square kilometres with 100,000 people and we're dealing with one single local government unit. So here is another advantage that I see uh, Andy uh, having. So I want to focus on a series of paradoxes. And as you read them, uh, you might be intrigued by them. And I've deliberately made these provocative, and I'm going to work through some of them. They may seem to you that some of them don't directly relate to the environment, but I assure you that if you start to think about them in a creative way, they do. I won't read them all. There's some very interesting ones there, you know. How could eating more save water? I'll come back to that. Um, why the solution to car parking may be to build fewer car parks. Perhaps we could call them, if we call them car storage areas, we have a better appreciation of what they are. So they may appear to you be a fairly silly list, but let's start to analyse them. But before we do, I must return to climate change, uh, because I don't think we can uh, launch an environmental strategy process without addressing something about climate change. First of all, I'd suggest to you that if anyone here has the answer, Stand up <coughs> and we'll follow you. <laughs> um, and certainly the city's environment strategy won't have the answer. I put to you that climate change is a problem different to any that we've ever faced. And I'll give you a, a little anecdote that will, I think, illustrate this. On the one hand, it appears to be a totally intractable problem. And you might have noticed that I haven't used weasel words. I haven't talked about climate variability or we weather variability. It's climate change. All right. If you disagree with that, happy to have a discussion later. When we're faced with a real problem, 
One of the solutions often, often is to do things differently than what we've done in the past because we know that the, the problem won't be resolved by continuing to do the same thing. I suggest to you that when it involves politicians, we have a real problem. And if you then combine it with the obvious element of behaviour change, it becomes an even further confounded problem. But compounded problem. Let me illustrate this. Uh, quite a few years ago, I happened to go to I, I happened to go to a talk by a retiring state commissioner for the environment, and a few days later, I happened to be talking to the secretary of a parliamentary committee. And their two stories were almost parallel. And this was their story. If an issue is on the front page of the age, basically politicians don't care. Because right? they know who votes and who buys the age. If it's on the front page of the Herald Sun, there's a, a bit of a worry. If it appears two days in a row on the front page of the Herald Sun, there was a real panic. If it appears three days in a row on the front page of the Herald <coughs> Sun, there'll be a cabinet committee meeting. Right? And what the Commissioner of the Environment said was that there's usually two ways of solving a problem that appears three days in a row on the front page of the Herald Sun. You can either throw a huge bucket of money at it, or you can set up a committee or an inquiry. And he said, the trouble with climate change is there is no bucket of money and there is no committee or inquiry that's going to fix it. And this is actually going to be a recurring situation. And I'd suggest, um, Robin, in your processes, that climate change will continue to be raised and it won't be solved in the, in the, in the duration of the environmental strategy. But it does come back to something that you said, Robin, and that is that we actually all share this problem. So my paradox for you there really is that actually politicians refusing to address climate change may turn out to be the best approach because it puts it in the realm of us. We can't say, oh, if only the po politicians would do something, it will fix the problem. It's more than that. Um, I, I suggest to you that there are times when the community is way ahead of where the politicians are. I think the community was way ahead of politicians when we had water problems. And I suggest to you that the politicians are way behind where the community is in terms of gay marriage. There are problems that actually get ahead of the political process. I'd like to now turn to the way I would describe the Bendigo situation. And I've termed it Bendigo's DNA. We know what DNA is. It's that fundamental, um, distinctive set of characteristics that sets us apart individually but collectively as well. I'm going to borrow some work. We, we commissioned a person called Mike Scott, who works with a firm called Plowsphere. Mike and I were talking about this concept. He was doing some work. We commissioned him to do some uh, particular work around Bendigo. So this is someone out from outside who knows Bendigo a little, who read a little bit about Bendigo, who talked to a number of people in Bendigo and had a take on what our DNA is. So DNA, of course, is, a, is potentially a wide concept. It is partly derived from our <coughs> environmental setting. It is about the historical narrative of the city. We, we know that distinctive narrative. Uh, there are lots of people have lived and prospered in Bendigo and they contributed to that. And there are what we call anchor institutes. There are things that will, that will survive all of us. Some of those are in the shape of buildings. Some of them might be the forest. Others will be perhaps institutions that will probably last, but may not last forever, Bendigo Bank. Mm -hmm. right. We don't expect the Bendigo Hospital to be going anywhere else. It will still be there. These are part of our DNA. But this self-contained nature of the city, this idea that the city is actually large enough to support itself in most of the things it does. Of course, when we examine the DNA, the first examination we need to do is what happened in Indigenous times. And clearly, uh, and there's you know, some wonderful old maps which show the winding nature of the Bendigo Creek, the fact that there were 
wooded areas close to the to the creek. <coughs> there was a you know sets of probably four or five hundred year old red gums, <coughs> um, but there were also cleared areas around the creek. So this chain of ponds <coughs> formed the Bendigo Creek. It still is part of our DNA. You can go to the botanical gardens and you can see the original uh, layout of the Bendigo Creek in that lake. We've also got a place DNA that's been created by Europeans. And I, it's an ironic DNA because it's a DNA of a European civilization imposed upon what is a relatively harsh landscape and environment. And that mix has created um, some wonderful interplay, both in a historical sense and the way in which we use the environment. I, I would have said once that it was so determinant, that environment, that we, it was in our face all the time. But one of the themes I'm perhaps putting to you is that we, we are starting to get a disconnect <coughs> with the environment. Perhaps not so much with the group that's here, but with many people. And I'll, I'll use some examples later to indicate that. So our place DNA is also around this rim of forested hills, that dramatic southern entrance of Big Hill. The fact that we are actually physically separated from the hinterland that sits around us that rural hinterland. You drive through the forest to get into Bendigo. We tend to take it um, as though, well, that's just the way things are. But when you examine around the world, we can only find about a dozen <coughs> cities around the world of Bendigo size where this is the characteristic. This is part of our DNA. And of course, there are many other elements of our DNA, whether it be the Chinese, the Cornish, the Irish, the German, the German architecture, the long established institutions that I've talked about, the nature, the self contained nature, the idea of the sophistication of an art scene, which is an emerging element of our DNA. So, how do we, how do we generate our own understanding of DNA? I want to give you very, four very, very quick examples of how I developed a feeling of a DNA of Bendigo. Uh, when my son, who's about 35 now, um, when he was about 11, he and two of his mates went out and camped alongside the Compaspe River at Axtar. And uh, they, when he came back, I said, how'd you go? Oh, I said, it was great, fantastic time. He said, gee, the water in the, in the river was dirty. And I thought, um, has he not realised that we've done that? I said, well, once upon a time, of course, it would have been pristine. It would have been pristine pure. Would it? So here's a kid who's, in the best days, is pretty smart. He'd grown up with the assumption that water in creeks was dirty. He'd, he'd lost that connect with nature. Fairly soon after, I was talking to a former Shire engineer of this old Shire of Karong, which many of you know embraces Inglewood. I think you worked there, Darren. Embraced Inglewood and uh, Bort and Wedderburn, Pyramid Hill. And he was saying that he'd been talking to some of the old farmers, the farmers in the seventh, who were in their 70s and 80s, it was about early 1990s, and he, they were telling him how they used to fish in all these creeks across the Shire. And he couldn't believe it, because every one of those creeks was dry for all but a few days of the year when, when they flowed. And he couldn't believe that what the change had made. It was a wonderful story to just sort of show how that change and that disconnect from nature. Some of you will know um, Alison Teese, who lives just near Carisbrook on the Tullaroo Creek. I had an amazing experience of going out on her property with a group of students in the company of Uncle Brian Nelson. And what Brian had done just a few months before along the Tullaroo Creek, their property straddles it, He'd gone out with Alison's husband, I just can't remember Alison's husband's name. He had lived on this property for about 65 years. And Brian Nelson showed him things he'd never seen before. And uh, he said, I've played everywhere. As a kid, I, I have walked every inch of this farm. And he showed him the directional tree. He showed him the birthing tree. He showed him the corroboree ground that, of course, he had, with his white European eyes, had simply not seen. And the last one is a story about a fifth generation landowner in Axtar, who in front of 30 or 40 other people in the community was crying his eyes out as he described the fact 
that he suddenly got what in the indigenous community was about with the idea of country because a mining company was proposing to dig up his land and he got that message. And so I'm sure we've all had these sort of uh, epiphanies, if you like, where things have suddenly resonated with us and we realise what our DNA might be about. Let me give you one other story of DNA, which is an interesting one, because it involves a politician. Sharman Stone, many of you will know Sharman, did her Masters and PhD work around uh, the northern parts of this region. And she spoke at a conference that I organised, and she literally had people in the audience in tears with the story that she told. And the story she told <coughs> was that in 19, about 1982-83, coming off the back of a period when people didn't really understand dry land salinity or more particularly denied that it existed because to admit that you had dry land salinity on your property was admission that your property was worthless and that you were worthless, you were a failure. So she had a project where she went around and interviewed as many farmers as she could. Every one of them she knew they had dry land salinity. She went and interviewed them around their kitchen table and farmer after farmer denied there was a problem. And she thought, well, I'm never going to write my thesis. My thesis was about what, what a farmer's going to do when they understand they've got dry land salinity. She had interviewed over 20 people. And then one night she got a phone call from a farmer who was crying. And he said, I have to tell you that my farm is riddled with dry land salinity, even though I told you earlier today it's not. But he said, I'm, it's a shame. I'm ashamed to say it because he said, I've let my great-grandfather down in what he did. And she told this story, and it was a, a much longer version than what I've given you, and she took us through. And really, what are the lessons from that? I'd suggest to you the lessons to that is that we need to get people to join the narrative. You need to understand the narrative. We need to realise that we share the problem. And until we do, and until we understand the impact on the community, then I don't know whether we can start the conversation in a fully meaningful way. So let me go to some of these paradoxes I gave you. Population growth. Well, there are people, of course, who say that the Bendigo, what we need to do is put a fence at Big Hill and say to people, no more people in Bendigo. Um, despite the fact that some people might like to do that, of course it's illegal. Um, unless we issue a Bendigo passport and declare ourselves as independent from Australia, um, in which case we won't have boat people, but we'll have sort of car people that we'll have to divert. Um, but, so people naturally go to the solution, well, what we just have to do is stop people having children. Right? Actually, the problem is, it's the seven billion we've got here now. And I was staggered when I, I saw this next information. I think many people know that we're going to 9 billion people by 2050. <coughs> In actual fact, it's predicted that the population will probably stabilise, or close to stabilise in 2050, only if something happens. And that is, if the poorest 1 to 2 billion get better education, get electricity, get basic, basic health services, and undertake family planning. And of course, if they do get that better education, that's the best thing to do for family planning. So it's not actually about the number of children that are being born, um, because actually the number of children being born is the same now as it was 25 years ago. The real issue is what do we do with the people who are on the planet now? Um, because it's a problem of ageing. That's the real problem. That we're all going to live longer than people have lived before. That's why the population is going up. So my suggestion to you is why would we look at a place like Bendigo as a laboratory, if you like, because we've got a growing population and we've got an ageing population. We mirror some of the things in the world. Now what I've done in these little red notes down here, quite often in talks you get a, a website link and people are trying to write it down. It contains all sorts of hieroglyphics. I've just said, if you just search these, you'll find some fascinating presentations. If you've never seen Hans Rosling's presentations, they are brilliant. Okay, so health. So I'm suggesting to you that one of the best things that's happened is that we've got a health problem in Bendigo. And it might be even better if it gets worse. 
John Nalda at the, at the Benigo Hospital, Benigo Health, has put six million dollars on the table and said, I can't build a hospital big enough to take all the people that will come into this hospital. I've asked around the state. I'm, no one has heard of any other director of a hospital in Victoria taking on that sort of an issue. I think it's a wonderful opportunity. Um, if we can link health with the environment and there are ways we can do it. So what we're talking about here is the fundamental changes that are happening in the way we live our lives. Um, Peter made some comments, the Mayor made some comments about the type of city we've got. I think we now know that over the last two generations or so, we've probably made some mistakes in the way in which we designed the city. If you want to see the way in which people will look at the city in the future, have a look at Council's Active Living Census. It's a wonderful uh, expose of the changes, the social changes that are happening. I mentioned to some people today uh, about the fact that the over 20s don't want to be involved in organised sport anywhere near to the extent that people think. And a guy popped up in the group that I was talking to and said, well, I run Bendigo Table Tennis. And I thought, uh-oh, here we go. <laughs> and he said, you're right. He said, the growth in table tennis is people who want to play casual table tennis. We cannot provide enough resources to meet the need. But we don't want, people don't want organised sport. They don't want to participate in things. So have a think about this. Um, and you might give a moment's silence for it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, <laughs> you, you've probably seen these pictures before. Perhaps the one on the top left um, is a classic. The one on the bottom right, I tried to find a photograph where people would queue to use an escalator rather than use the stairs. Um, which leads us to this wonderful little quote. Um, okay. So let's take another topic, water and food. Now I did cheat with this one. I remember I said that you could eat more, um, well, and, and it would, in its relationship with water. I want to talk to you about three, three really interesting examples. <coughs> Lettuces are 92% water. So if you buy a lettuce that's traveled from the Ord River, <coughs> you may as well actually contribute to a pipeline, a water pipeline. And so a lettuce grown in your garden <coughs> has generated, you've generated the water in, in your own property if you've got a tank and you've kept that water on your property. It's the most extreme example I know, but many of our fruits and vegetables of course are in that category. The story of two fruit canneries. About 20 years ago in Shepparton, SPC and Ardmona were challenged about the amount of water they were using. So Shepherd and area, about 60,000 people, it was, it was worked out that the amount of water that was being consumed by those two canneries was the equivalent of watering a city of 330,000 people. Now, of course, once we started to price water, people started to look much more sensibly about how we use water. So how could eating more save a lot of water? Okay. It came out two days ago that in Canada they now estimate that 40% of the food that's produced in Canada is wasted. It's beyond its shelf life, it's put in the freezer, put in the refrigerator, left out and it's thrown away. So how does this relate to Melbourne and Sydney? Because it's now estimated that the amount of embedded water in the food that is thrown away in Australia is the equivalent of the amount of water that's consumed by Melbourne and Sydney each year. So why is this important? Because one of the, one of the potential dis distractions in this um, whole process we're going through is that people will become obsessed with water, and they should be, but we need to keep it realistic. It's a lot of it about the way in which we use water. This was produced yesterday in America. Um, and I have given you the full details here. Uh, this guy has mapped the whole of America and found that if there are many parts of America where 80% of the food can be, can be grown within 50 miles, 80 kilometres, of where people live. And yet the average item in America that goes on people's tables is estimated to have travelled 3,000 kilometres. So let's turn to another element. How do you get to school? 
I posed this question to a group of people at the Bendigo Historical Society recently, average age, probably 70. I asked them how they got to school. Walked, bicycle, horse, tram. I asked them how their children, their grandchildren got to school. Car, car, car. <coughs> what did the children at White Hills tell us? When we surveyed the grades four, five and six, we had 35% said they walked or cycled or scooted, which was remarkably high. 86% said they wanted to. <laughs> what did the students at La Trobe University's Bendigo campus admit, uh, what did they admit to us? Uh, this is embarrassing. They buy a car parking permit at the university subsidised through the BSA, the Bendigo Student Association, for $46 a year. 600 of them live on campus. Many admitted that they drove the car from the car park in the residential area to the car park closer to the camp. Have we got an embarrassment, embarrassment here, have we? <laughs> yeah, you know it's right. Worse still, some admitted they actually drove their car to the gym on the campus. <laughs> so why are our roads unsafe for children? Why won't people use them? Because 30% of the people in the morning are driving their kids to, to school, and that's where the traffic is. Um, when you can video, video these, and you can find that uh, outside of school, people are telling you it is unsafe to drive to school, and yet people are triple parking to let their kids off at the school, <laughs> we have a problem. So what we have to move from is what I call the nobody paradox. You often hear this, somebody should do something about something, or nobody is doing anything about anything. But yet, if you look at both those paradoxes, how often do we hear that? We, we actually um, absolve ourselves as, from part of the problem. So when you're stuck in traffic, you're actually part of the problem. Right? I want to give you examples of two cities at 7.40 a.m. First one, you can search the age takes the east-west morning peak hour. Darren Gray, who's a reporter who does a lot of work for the age. Darren drove it. <coughs> at 7.40 a.m. He was about around Blackburn Road, right? And he was in traffic. There were times when he could speed up to about 60 kilometres an hour, but he wasn't in, in uh, a free-flowing zone. So yesterday morning, I took these photographs in Bendigo at 7.40 a.m. <laughs> Williamson Street. Uh, no one on Williamson Street. If you think I'm making it up, um, you, you can actually work out the clock. It's 7.40, <laughs> Myers Street, Napier Street at 8.40. There's our traffic congestion. Um, one of the great things, Prue Mansfield, one of our directors, says one of the things, the defining elements of the DNA of Wendigo is that when you ask people how long it takes to get to work, they don't say, oh, 10 or 15 minutes. They say, 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so what is, the defining, what is the defining story about our traffic? And actually, this is a really interesting map because it helps you to understand how Bendigo operates, but it also helps you to understand how Bendigo could operate. So the map, there's three elements in the map. The green is our public land. This is not the forested areas that will be cleared. These are the public land areas which will be with us well beyond our, all our lifetime. All right? So we've got a defined physical area. The second area is we've got the major roads are all shown. And thirdly, the thickness of the traffic, thickness of the line is the amount of traffic. Ironically, we have been blessed with an extraordinary urban form which is so easy to manage in a much better way. If we were a, a conventional city where everything grew out in concentric rings, we'd have people going in all directions. In actual fact, what's happening is that people can only go in a limited number of directions, which actually means, even though it produces high volumes on some of our roads, it means that we've actually got options on those roads. And of course, the, the great spine of Bendigo is Huntley to Kangaroo Flat. And in that, we've got a highway, we've got a railway line, we've got bus routes, we've got a walking and cycling trail. There are a few cities of 
the size of Mendigo have got that. If we project out the traffic and we do nothing, this is the, this is the sort of 60 year horizon. The, the inner, inner yellow, it'll be a bit hard to see if you look back, but the inner yellow is 1970, the outer blue is what will be in 2030. That's if we do nothing. <coughs> so what we see in Napier Street will be worse unless we do something different. So this defining structure of the urban Benigo, it is part of the DNA and we have to use that to address our environmental challenges. We are blessed by the fact that 47% of the jobs are in the city centre because it actually means it's easier to plan and manage a city if the jobs are concentrated in one place or a few limited places than if they're spread all over the place. We have these four corridors, each with their own distinctive focus. We have a natural urban growth boundary. The Mayor spoke about the urban growth boundary. It is partly created by nature for us. And we have these strong transport spines. So the Mayor spoke about the integrated transport land use strategy. And I just want to give you a very, very quick insight into some of the things we're doing because every one of them has an environmental impact. So what we're suggesting in, in Italus is that if one in five people make a change in the way in which they commute to work one in five days, we can immediately take 2,000 vehicles off the roads. Right? If you extrapolate that, we can actually hold the traffic volumes at the level they are now if we can keep doing taking some vehicles off the road. We need to target some improvements and um, I know the council has been seriously looking at that issue about how we can focus our development and our, our works into particular hotspots where it'll ha make a big difference. Partnerships is a big issue, and I'll talk about that in a second. We link it to the health and wellbeing benefits of these changes. And of course, we integrate transport and land use around things like 10 minute neighbourhoods. So fundamentally, what we're doing is we're changing the way in which we have looked in the past at transport. In the past, transport has been business as usual, keep doing what you're doing, just build more. So the difference is that we still use the same network we've got, but we actually see the wider potential of the network. We realise the benefits of shifting, both in terms of people's health, shifting mode in terms of people's health, in terms of dollar savings, and we integrate transport and land use. And we have partnerships with key organisations these are the sort of organisations that want to work with us on this journey. Now, if you're not convinced about all this, um, here's another thing if you want to search. <coughs> search Paul Tranter, the hurry syndrome. Essentially what Paul says is the more you work to pay for that second car, actually, the less time you have. And he quotes examples from around the world and Portland, Oregon is the best one where they've done the work. People in Portland, Oregon spend three weeks a year less working because they have more transport options and they don't need to work for a second car. Think about it. So you might say, well, our bus is the answer. I imagine we might get some people in your environmental process, Robin, who want to address the issues of buses. One of the issues is why, we, why would we have such big buses running around Bendigo that are empty? Um, there's more fundamental questions than that. How many people travel on buses? 1.4 million trips per year on buses. Huh? I suspect that very few people in this room use buses occasionally and certainly not regularly. So who travels on the buses? 90% of the people on the buses hold a concession card. There are parts of urban Bendigo where up to 6% of the people who live in the area do not have a car. They obviously, buses perform an essential social um, uh, uh, support. So how much does it cost? Essentially, the government subsidises Bendigo's buses to the tune of $10 million a year. How much do they make in revenue? About $3 million. Think about that. Ironically, for another $3 million, all buses could be free in Bendigo. No, it's just a matter of where you put your, allocate your costs. I don't actually advocate free buses, but I certainly, I wonder how many people know that if you, even if you pay full fare, for $4.40, you can travel all day unlimited on the buses in Bendigo. 
certainly a lot cheaper than travelling by car. Now people say that buses aren't frequent enough. Yes, we know that. I'll put another suggestion to you. Have you ever seen the buses in Bendigo advertised? There has never been an advertising campaign about using buses. Why? Because, and this is not the fault of the bus companies, it's the contract they have with the, with the state government. You, they get paid the same amount whether the bus is full or empty. They get paid <coughs> for delivering a service. There's very few people in the world get paid for delivering a service whether anyone uses it or not. Um, here's another way of thinking differently. So you might think that bicycles are the answer. Well, if bicycles are the answer, I put to you what is the question and what do you want the answer to be? Because if you want the answer to be that we should use a lot more bicycles, then we need to change a lot of things. And if you need to understand those changes, please search this. This is the most amazing video. Delft, a community city in, in the Netherlands, has just completed a bicycle parking area at their railway station that holds 5,000 bicycles. Right? And it's virtually full the whole time. The interesting thing is that Delft's population is exactly the same as Bendigo. Now you might say, oh, it's flat. Because it's in the Netherlands, it will be flat. Yes, it is flat, but I much prefer our winter, even on a day like today, than the Netherlands winter. Right? So, if you're really not convinced about some of the things I'm talking about, here are the ultimate traffic paradoxes. Study after study has shown that generally, adding road capacity actually <coughs> increases the number of cars. And I think we, we know that. It's starting to come through in some of the discussion around Melbourne. Secondly, we're actually giving away incredibly valuable space when we allocate it for one purpose, and that is to park a car. Much of our spaces around our city are used between 9 o'clock and 5 o'clock as car storage areas. And I'm talking about the streets, I'm not talking about the off-street car parking. If you're not convinced about this, uh, have a look at what's called Brazer's Paradox. This is a Dutch uh, mathematician 50 years ago who demonstrated conclusively that if you provide more uh, access for cars, you actually induce more access and, and increase the traffic volumes. So let's turn to the final one about livability. <coughs> How would, you, how would our retailers make more money if we had more trees? The search I've given you there of Vision 2020, the report that was released last week, one of the findings of this report, which is an Australia-wide examination of cities, including Bendigo, demonstrates conclusively that where you have trees in the centre of the city, the retailing is up between 12 and 17%. Right. So here's something we would want to do in Bendigo, provide that shade, provide vegetation uh, throughout the, the community. It actually has a retail spend impact. And of course, if you've never uh, come across Donald Shoup's work, the, high, the wonderfully titled The High Cost of Free Car Parking, uh, please uh, Google it. It is a wonderful read. So all these things around livability how are they going to come about? We had a discussion about eight of us today about what we call pop-up things, where um, the community is actually activating things. And I want to give you an amazing example from a place called Oak Cliff in Dallas, a guy called Jason Roberts. About nine years ago, Jason Roberts got the idea in Dallas that his community needed a light rail. Right? So he had no idea. Know how, how to go about getting a light rail. So what he did was he created a website and he called it the Oak Cliff Transit Authority. Uh -huh. No money, no plans, no approval from anyone. Last year they opened the Oak Cliff light rail. $43 million, $27 million from the federal government, $16 million from the Dallas, whatever it is, Transit Authority, uh, and created it. We actually are in danger if we don't get really aggressive in our environmental strategy of the community running over the top of us with ideas. So how can we measure these changes? Um, many of you will know that the council has been going through the process of adopting livability indicators. We have in our 24 indicators, uh, we've got seven that directly, I think, relate to the environment in one way or another. 
and you can read them there. And they are about the way in which we move around the city, about the way in which we understand the DNA of the city, about the way we go forward in terms of a whole range of issues. And there's the other three. So we actually have got some vibe already as to how we might measure our progress, perhaps in different ways. So in conclusion, I'm suggesting to you that perhaps <coughs> our environmental agenda won't necessarily be resolved by tackling issues head on <coughs> as though we can simply resolve it issue by issue. This is about a progressive shift and change across the community. Very few or almost none of the suggestions or ideas I've put to you are driven from a purist environmental perspective. Oh, they, they don't start at that point, but, and they don't necessarily have an articulated environmental outcome, but the outcome of doing them will be a fundamental change. So I believe we can do huge environmental gains, but perhaps we can shift Bendigo into a better place, but we need some new ways of doing it. Thank you. The other thing that happens is that you, while you're doing all that learning and bigger thinking is that you're in for a massive headache at some stage. It'll be now or it'll be uh, visiting you soon. Uh, so thank you, Phil. And the other thing is that as an MC, it is almost impossible to summarise uh, Trevor when he does a speech because there are so many different concepts being tied together there. So thanks again, Trevor.